Whether you're working in ITU or in another acute care specialty, you're very likely to come across tracheostomized patients at some point. This can be a little intimidating if you aren't familiar with tracheostomies, so we've designed this video to provide you with a basic understanding. Firstly, a tracheostomy is defined as a procedure to create an opening through the neck into the trachea. I've broadly split the reasons for tracheostomy into two categories, ITU-specific and other. In ITU, patients who have been dependent on a ventilator for a prolonged period of time may require slow weaning as their lungs and respiratory muscles recover. Tracheostomies are far less stimulating for the airway than endotracheal tubes, meaning that patients can continue to receive ventilatory support via the tracheostomy tube whilst being able to lessen sedation. This is an important part of the rehabilitation process for many ITU patients. The main other context in which you are likely to see a tracheostomy tube is in head and neck surgical patients who have some form of upper airway obstruction that needs to be bypassed. Let's have a look at what a tracheostomy tube looks like. Here we have side-on and front-on views. The tracheostomy tube has a cuff at the end which is designed to seal the trachea. This creates a closed circuit between the ventilator and the lungs so that pressure can be applied via the ventilator. It also helps prevent aspiration. The flange is the part of the tracheostomy tube which sits on the outside against the patient's neck. This will be used to suture the tube and ensure it doesn't get dislodged. The cuff is inflated via a pilot balloon which dangles from the tracheostomy tube on the outside. Many tracheostomy tubes used in ITU will also have a subglottic suction port, though it is not present on all tracheostomy tubes. This is a port through which you can aspirate secretions that sit between the glottis and the cuff. We'll discuss this in more detail later. Tracheostomy size, like endotracheal tubes, is usually described based on their internal diameter. Most tracheostomy tubes used in adult patients will range from 6 to 8 millimeters. One very important point to know about tracheostomy tubes is that it's actually made up of two tubes, an inner and an outer tube. The inner tube can be easily removed whilst keeping the outer tube in place. It's designed this way so that if mucus were to obstruct the lumen, the inner tube can be removed and replaced whilst keeping the outer tube where it is. Note that the outer tube may have a different external component to the inner tube and this may not connect directly to the ventilator without some sort of adapter. So if the inner tube is removed, you often need to replace it with a fresh inner tube to be able to connect it easily back to the ventilator. This is what a tracheostomy tube looks like in situ. You can see how the cuff seals the airway and creates a closed circuit between the ventilator and the patient's lungs so that pressures and volumes delivered to the lungs can be controlled without the air leaking upwards and outwards. When a tracheostomy tube is connected to a ventilator in ITU, it will look something like this. There will be tubing going into the ventilator and there will also be a plastic sleeve containing a suction catheter that can be guided into the airways when required to perform deep suctioning. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to leave this out of the diagrams used so that we can focus on the tracheostomy tube itself. We learned about the subglottic suction port earlier when looking at the tracheostomy tube and this is why it's useful. Some people in ITU may develop quite significant secretions from the upper airway that can pool on top of the cuff. These secretions can drip down into the lungs and cause ventilator-associated pneumonia. Regular subglottic mucus clearance can help reduce the risk of patients developing ventilator-associated pneumonias. When working in ITU, you may also hear the term speaking valve being used. It's also sometimes referred to as a passimuel valve or PMV. It's essentially a small valve that can be attached to the outer end of the tracheostomy tube. It's very important that patients with a speaking valve in place have their cuff deflated, also known as cuff down, and you'll see why in the next slide. Above the tracheostomy tube, we have the larynx, the middle part of which is the glottis or vocal cords. The speaking valve is a one-way valve that allows air in during inspiration, but then does not allow air to come out of the tracheostomy tube during expiration. As the cuff should be down, it means that during expiration, the air passes around the cuff and through the glottis, thereby allowing speech to be generated. This image should hopefully make it clear why it's important that the cuff is deflated, 
If it was not deflated, then air would only be able to go into the lungs through the tracheostomy tube and cannot come out because the valve is in place. One caveat I'd like to highlight is that you can also get fenestrated tracheostomy tubes. These have one or more small holes within the tube, meaning that air can pass upwards and outwards via the glottis whilst the cuff is up, thereby enabling sound to be generated. Though fenestrated tubes are useful in rehabilitating the patient's voice, it does run the risk of upper airway secretions dripping down through the fenestrations into the patient's lungs or obstructing the tube itself. With regards to managing tracheostomy emergencies, there's a very clear guideline that's written by the National Tracheostomy Safety Project. I'd strongly recommend having a read through the guideline on the website. The link is in the description. To make sense of some of the steps involved, I'm going to go through them using some diagrams to illustrate why each step is performed. In any tracheostomy emergency, for example, where the patient is suddenly desaturating or struggling to breathe, the first thing you should do is call for help and then look, listen and feel at the mouth and tracheostomy. You are checking whether the patient is breathing. If they are not, this should be treated as a respiratory arrest and a call should be put out to the resuscitation team. CPR should be started if there is no pulse or signs of life. If the patient is breathing, high flow oxygen should be applied to the face and tracheostomy, and then you should assess tracheostomy patency. If there is a speaking valve in place, it should be removed, and then the inner tube should also be removed. You might find that there's a plug of mucus within the inner tube that you have just removed. As per the point I made earlier regarding the connections between the tubes and the ventilator, a new inner tube may need to be inserted to, to enable it to be connected to the breathing circuit. The next step involves passing a suction catheter through the tube to try and drain any secretions that may be causing an obstruction. If the suction catheter can pass through the tracheostomy tube into the airways, it suggests that the tube is patent but may be partially obstructed. Tracheal suction should be performed and the patient can be ventilated via the tracheostomy. If the suction catheter cannot be passed, the cuff should be deflated and you should look, listen and feel at the mouth and tracheostomy for exhaled air. Waveform capnography should be used if available to confirm that the patient is breathing and the airway is patent. If the patient is stable or improving, it is likely that the tracheostomy tube is partially obstructed or displaced. If the patient is not improving or remains unstable, the tracheostomy tube should be removed. You should then look, listen and feel at the mouth and tracheostomy for expired air. Oxygen should be applied to the face and stoma and waveform capnography should be used. If after all of these measures the patient is not breathing, the patient should be ventilated via the upper airways using a bag valve mask. The stoma should be covered to stop gas from escaping. If this is unsuccessful, ventilation should be attempted via the stoma. A paediatric face mask or a supraglottic airway device, such as a laryngeal mask airway, should be used to achieve the best possible seal around the stoma. Secondary emergency options that should be considered if you continue to struggle to ventilate the patient include oral intubation or intubation of the stoma with a 6mm tracheostomy tube or tracheal tube. Instruments like a bronchoscope or a bougie may be helpful when attempting these measures. Any attempt at intubation should only be performed by a suitably airway trained individual because it does run the risk of causing significant bleeding and forming a false passage. I'd like to reiterate that these slides were primarily for the purpose of helping visualize the different steps in the management of a tracheostomy emergency. I would strongly recommend visiting the National Tracheostomy Safety Project website in your own time to have a look at the full guidelines and the demonstration video. Finally, I'd like to briefly talk about laryngectomies. A laryngectomy is a surgical procedure in which the larynx is removed, a barrier is created between the pharynx and the trachea, and a stoma is created to connect the trachea to the skin. It's important to note that in the case of a laryngectomy, given that a barrier has been created between the pharynx and the trachea, no ventilation will take place through the nose and mouth. The barrier is formed to prevent aspiration given that the larynx has been removed, and so administering oxygen or trying to ventilate the patient through the mouth will not be effective. There is a separate emergency algorithm for laryngectomies that is written by the National Tracheostomy Safety Project. This can also be found in the description below.